Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. So in this video, I want to talk about the Petrov defense. Um, I'm going to show you 11 games here um, in one specific line. And I just want to express my uh, my love for this opening, actually, because I feel like um, in E4, E5, the main defense that everyone chooses is the, um, is the Rui Lopez because it's so um, rich strategically. And I believe that if people do want to get better at chess and they play e4, they have to play the Rui Lopez sooner or later. Um, but uh, the Petrov is a very respectable opening, and I think it gets a bad reputation because of its strong drawish tendencies. Um, but we will see actually um, some games where Black manages to win. And I think that in the lower level, especially like the club player level, um, people just assume that it's such a drawish opening, and so they don't spend any time analyzing it at, at all. And so I think that still uh, there are a lot of ways to outplay your opponent, and especially in faster time controls, like better understanding of the position will lead you to better results. And um, yeah, like people don't want to force to draw as white typically. And so as a black player, you know, if we were playing a stronger player, uh, even over the board in classical chess, then we should be fairly happy with a result like that. Um, but yeah, if you do want to, um, you know, choose an opening that's that can get wins even against um, people who are um, super well booked up, then you probably have to look somewhere else other than the Petrov. But I still think that it's a very respectable opening. So, uh, first game is Cheperinov versus Wang Ye, who, um, when he was an active player um, at the top, um, he, yeah, he was one of the main practitioners. And so this game starts off with e4, e5, knight f3, and knight f6, the Petrov defense. And we're only going to be looking at the line with knight takes e5 here um, because there is another move d4, which has gained popularity recently. Uh, it was recommended by Anish Giri in his course on 1e4. And there are a couple of lines that are good for um, good for black. Um, just in general, I think knight takes e4, bishop d3. d5 is the most solid move, uh, although knight c6 is also quite playable. Um, and yeah, the theory can stretch for a long time here. But I think I will be discussing this in the second video. Um, yeah, uh, and so instead we're going to be looking at the main move here, knight takes e5. And after d6, kicking the knight back, knight takes e, um, knight f3, knight takes e4, and pawn to d4, and pawn to d5. So we reach an interesting position where it looks like um, the position is quite symmetrical, but black has a knight on e4, which you could say that black is up a tempo um, compared to the advanced French, uh, sorry, the exchange French, because we can actually get a very similar position from the French. E4, E6, D4, D5, takes, takes, knight F3, and knight F6. But now, instead of playing knight F6 in this position, it's like we have an extra move to play the move knight F6 to E4. And so we now reach um, this position, where we are basically uh, a tempo up. But the, but the thing that White is arguing is that the knight on E4 is actually more unstable than it is stable. And so White will put pressure on the knight with bishop D3, perhaps knight D2 or knight C3, we will see sometimes. Um, and also the possibility of playing this move pawn to C4, um, yeah, to undermine uh, the base of our pawn chain here. Um, and so that's the general idea of it. And Black will try their best to first off maintain a, a knight on E4. And they have ideas of either bishop f5 to support the knight um, or even bishop g4 to put pressure on this knight and later play the move f5. So we will see a couple of examples where this works and where it actually doesn't work. Um, and so in this position, bishop d3 is the main move, uh, putting pressure on the knight. And here, there are a couple of systems that uh, black can go for. I do think that the best move objectively is the move bishop d6. But this has not been the main move um, uh, historically, um, and this was the favorite of uh, Caruana um, yeah, in his career uh, when he played the Petrov regularly, and uh, it's very active. It's a very um, nice system, I believe, with bishop f5 and c6 next. But in this video, I'm going to be talking about the move bishop e7, um, which is a line that um, I think has more drawish tendencies than bishop d6, but it's still very much playable in the modern era. Uh, and so here, white typically castles, and the black plays this move knight c6. So first off, talking about knight c6, knight c6 is a strange move because it walks behind the c-pawn, making us unable to play the move pawn to c6, but it controls the center and has the possibility of jumping with knight b4. And so this, this move knight c6 is very specific uh, to counteract this move pawn to c4. 
after which we will see that black plays a move knight b4, taking the bishop back, typically to e2. Um, yeah, so that's possible. But the thing is that with the move knight c6, the knight is quite misplaced, uh, where it typically has to reroute somewhere else. For example, after we castle, maybe improve the bishop to d6, uh, you know, develop the bishop out here, the knight can typically reroute itself to e7, or later find a spot on the square on d6. For example, we'll see a game later where the knight can actually go to e7, c8, and the d6, where it's actually a much better place there to control the center. Because on, on c6, it's actually being dominated by, uh, first off, this pawn um, on d4, and also this knight um, potentially coming to e5. So uh, yeah, another point of knight c6 is also that it parries the threat of knight e5, because now we can simply take it. But the issue is that if we, if we keep our knight on c6, then it does control the knight on f3. But it's not doing anything other than that. So yeah, it is kind of a concession in a way. But uh, yes, yeah, so that's some of these strategic um, points of knight c6. Uh, and so in this game, we will see the move knight c3, which I think is very common in the lower levels and people playing blitz because they what they want to do is that they want to um, double their B, uh, double their c-pawns um, and get some active diagonals for their bishops. Um, and also at the at some point play the move c4 to undermine this pawn and even use the open b file to put some pressure but here black will play the move bishop g4 um, so it's important to play it now before white is able to play the move h3 um, so yeah for example if we take on c3 and then play castles then h3 is very annoying since now we don't have a good place for our bishop on c8 so now bishop g4 is important rook e1 castles very natural rook b1 and now we're kind of forced to play the move rook b8. We're not ready to play b6 yet because of our unstable knight on c6. And so rook b8, which, you know, it misplaces the rook, but it uh, the rook wasn't doing anything on a8 either, so it doesn't really matter that much. And now bishop f4. So now in this position, I believe that the... Um, so the bishop is very active on this diagonal, but we have a very typical idea here of actually exchanging the bishop with a move like bishop d6. Now this was not played in this game. But I just want to show you the way to kind of equalize, is that after we exchange off the bishops, queen takes d6, um, white can either kick the bishop back with h3, or play this move rook e3, which is the most common move. And the idea is that they want to possibly double up on the e-file, um, or even just defend the knight on f3. So they can either go with the idea of queen d2, um, to unpin from this, from this annoying pin, or play the move queen e2 to dominate the e-file. And now here, the best move is the move bishop h5. This is another typical idea in the Petrov that you need to know, where the bishop is coming to g6, and typically um, we will recapture back with the h-pawn so that it actually gives more shelter to our king at the cost of doubling the pawns. And now, white has two moves here. White can play the move queen d2 or queen e2. Queen d2, the idea is to um, un yeah, unpin, but the problem is that we'd run to this very clever move, bishop takes f3. Now the idea is that if now g takes f3, then simply the pawns are very weak here. Um, and yeah, this is not desirable. And so after rook takes f3, black will actually just play first up b6, um, just uh, getting the pawn out of danger. And since the rook has left the e-file, black is just in time to, to uh, fight for control over the e-file. So for example, if rook e3, then after rook b to e8, black is managing to exchange a pair of rooks and will be fine in this position. Um, because even after rook e1, takes takes let's say uh even queen takes e3 then let's say g6 um blunting this bishop you know black has no problems here um they can even uh, look in the future to try to target some some weak pawns here um so yeah that looks like a nice position position and it said queen g5 is interesting to try to create an attack here but after rook b to e8 taking control over the e-file let's say rook g3 g6 Rook h3, and I'm just like putting some moves on the board to um, demonstrate that this is a... It looks kind of scary, but it should be fine for black after the move rook e7. With ideas that if black plays, if white plays queen h6, then simply f5. Closing down this bishop, we have domination over the e-file, and this is quite a nice position. Um, and this should be, this should give black equality uh, at the very least. Um, and so that's possible if queen d2. Now if queen e2, now we have this move f6. And now this move f6 is very nice because it controls the e5 square and also controls the e8 square. So now black is ready to actually play the move b6, get the pawn out of danger, and challenge the e-file. And if black is able to do that, then they'll be they'll be quite satisfied with the position. And so the most challenging move I could uh, I could find here 
um, is the move bishop f5 to try to infiltrate on e6. Also, another point is that uh, now that uh, we've controlled the e5 square, it leaves this knight with the possibility to move away from its from his duties of guarding the e5 square, which typically prevents knight e5. And so with this f6 move, it's really nice um, just to control more squares. So bishop f5, and now controlling the e6 square is important with bishop f7. And uh, I tried to find some lines here and just, just you know, try to dig some lines. And knight d2 looks interesting to try to improve the knight uh, later on uh, and also, also open up the queen's diagonal. And so here, b6, just uh, getting the pawn under danger. And um, after rook e1, rook b to e8, black is just in time to uh, to uh, challenge the e-file and we'll trade off some rooks with a fine position. Queen a6 here looks interesting to try to put some pressure, but here after rook takes e3, trading off a pair of rooks, this move knight e7 is really nice. So it kicks the bishop back, and typically white wants to keep the bishop on this diagonal to put some pressure, so bishop d3 makes a lot of sense. But now knight c8, and if white does nothing, then black will simply play queen d7, put the pawn to c6, so the queen can defend the a7 pawn, and then bring the knight to d6. Well, the, where the knight on d6 is very nicely positioned to control the, both the c4 and e4 squares. So white should probably play a move like c4 here and change the structure of the position. But there, yeah, black should be fine there with no, uh, specifically no bad pieces. Um, so yeah, we see that in this line, black is able to challenge the e file quite effectively. And so I'm going to criticize this move by Wang Yue, this move h6 we just played. Now, the reason this is not a great move is that now if you want to play the move f6, then it weakens all of the light squares. And so h6 is a big concession in the position. And white continued with h3, a typical useful move, bishop h5. And now the way to take advantage of this error is this move queen e2. The idea is that even if we exchange the bishops off with bishop d6, let's say um, probably taking on, on d6 to activate the queen isn't great. So queen e3. And the question is, what should what should uh, you know, what should black do next? Um, so yeah, here probably best is just to take on f4. Um, so if we play move like queen d7, I am kind of worried about the move knight e5. Uh, yeah, or additionally, this move even knight h4 is quite annoying. Um, with the possibility with the possibility of coming to f5, and so I don't like this position for uh, for black at all. And so bishop takes f4 is best. Queen takes f4. And even after we play bishop g6, so again, if you play queen d7, knight h4 is a typical thematic idea, threatening knight f5 and also pawn to g4, simply winning a pawn. Uh, so bishop g6 here is best, but for takes takes, clearly black has done something wrong uh, because they have double pawns on the, f5, uh, on the g file. And the problem behind these double pawns is that it no longer controls the e6 square. And so white has just free reign over this e file and is much better in this kind of position. So this is a disaster kind of Petrov. Um, and so instead, but instead rook e3 was played. Um, and so in this position, bishop d6, typical move trying to trade off the bishops, takes takes, queen e2, so far so good. And now black plays this move f5, which is another typical idea, but it's quite risky. Um, so yeah, in this specific position, it's not great, but uh, black needs to fight for counterplay somehow. Otherwise, they're just going to be much worse uh, in a position with no counterplay. So here, rook e6 was played. Bishop takes f3. Now this forces g takes f3 because uh, the yeah because the rook is hanging. Um, so after g f3, queen a3. So this is um, Black's idea to try to target some of the weak pawns. But um, there is this very nice improvement over the game, which is this move queen e1, with a very specific purpose that after uh, to keep to stay on the e file so that after the uh, moves that were played in the game, which was knight d8. Uh, Rook b3 is a, is a nice way to kick the queen away from this diagonal. And after queen a4, rook e7, uh, suddenly after like uh, queen c6 bringing the queen back, white has to move queen e5 and putting a lot of annoying pressure on here, on the pawn on f5, and even on the pawn on c7. And so white is simply winning in this position, like there's no defense. Um, but it said queen d2 was played. And this allowed uh, black to play the move knight d8. After rook e5, Play this move knight f7, a very nice move actually, sacrificing uh, one of the pawns. So now if rook takes d5, then queen takes a2, um, yeah, activates the queen, prepares to bring it uh, across this diagonal, and later, you know, if rook takes f5, um, we will see a very similar idea here 
uh, where I think even a G5 here is a good move. Um, but we will see an idea here after rook takes f5, similar to the game where black plays his move 96. And they under and Wang Yu understands that if we exchange off the rooks, then there will be pressure on the on the f pawn here, on the pawn on f3. Uh, and also the queen is quite active attacking some of the weaknesses. And so black should be doing fine there. And so white plays his move rook h5. And after rook takes f3, black has a very simple plan of doubling up on the f file and trying to simply win here and, and attack the, the white king because the white king is also unsafe in this kind of position. And in this position, king h1 is played, which uh, makes sense um, because it gets out of um, the rook takes f2 um, with, yeah, with, uh, with an attack, you know, closer to the king. But it's not really great because um, the pawn on f2 now lacks defense. So after rook b to f8, rook g1, this is a very nice move, rook 8 to f4. So this is perhaps what is missed. So now this this rook blocks actually the queen's infiltration to h6. And f2 is for the taking next. Queen e2 is played, and now knight e4. Even blockading the e-file to not give white any counterplay. And also attacking the f2 pawn. After bishop e4, d e4, queen c4 was played. But after king h7, surprisingly after queen e6, black has this very nice move queen f8. And a defense against all of the critical squares. And so even after queen g6, king h8, simply the white king is actually more in danger than the than the black king. And after rook e5, uh, white, uh, black played a very nice move here. Rook takes h3 first off, taking a pawn. And after king g2, rook takes e3, not caring about the threat of rook e8, because it will simply lose to a checkmate in two moves with rook h3 next. And so instead, rook, f, uh, rook f1 was played. But after rook c6, attacking the queen, queen h5, and king h7, there are no more threats in the position. Rook g6 is coming next, and this is a sim simply a lost position for uh, for white. So they resigned. So this kind of shows how um, you know how interesting the position can get, and how wild the position can get if um, you know if white plays this um, lesser known uh, sideline um, of doubling the B the c pawns and uh, getting this kind of position. But there are a lot of improve improvements we can learn from this game. So yeah, the next game is the move, is the game Michael Adams versus Jan Smits. Um, oops, uh, yeah, going back here. e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5. Um, oh, and just as a side note, uh, starting from the next three games, seven games, um, yeah, from the second, third, and fourth game, um, it's going to show a lot of tactical lines, which are the most critical lines in this bishop e7 Petrov. And so besides these three most critical forcing lines, there are not a lot of other forcing variations, so that's quite a nice thing to know. Um, but yeah, it's these are quite big branches, and so it's very important uh, to remember them. So again, pawn to d6, knight f3, knight takes e4, d4, and pawn to d5. And so bishop d3, knight c6. And so knight c6 or bishop e7 are interchangeable. They don't really change the position much. But I do prefer the move bishop e7, just because it uh, stays flexible with the knight on, uh, on b8, since at some point, you know, if white plays a move like knight bd2, it doesn't really make much sense to play the move, you know, to bring the knight to c6 here, as I think it would just simply be misplaced. Um, though it's quite playable, and we'll see a line uh, very similar to that actually later. Um, but yeah, simply knight c6 here, castles bishop e7, reaches the same position before. And in this game, we will see the move c4. And after our typical idea of playing knight b4, um, white has a couple of moves here. White can either retreat with the bishop on e2, which makes the most sense, or play this move c takes d5. And here we will simply take the bishop, knight takes d3, queen d3, and queen takes d5. So now, uh, after rook e1, white is arguing that their lead in development, our king in the center, and this unstable knight on e4, might be a potential target uh, for yeah, uh, for white's pieces. And so here bishop f5 was played, supporting the knight. And now knight e5. And this becomes very forcing, actually. So we will see a game later where knight c3 was played, um, but here knight e5. And now the idea is that they're actually taking away this g6 square from the bishop, so that now potentially a move like g4 can come. Uh, so here, it's important to castle long, to put some pressure on the d-pawn, and our king is quite safe on c8 here. Um, so g4 is possible, uh, but we will look at that, um, I think, some moves later. Uh, actually, no, g4 here, I think will, I think it fails to queen takes e5, uh, since the queen on d3 is hanging. So 
yeah, queen f3 is the main move here. And now, um, yeah, it attacks the bishop, and we can't retreat the bishop to g6, because it will simply be taken, and the knight on e4 will hang. So now g6. And now white wants to undermine the knight further, and plays the move g4. Now, this line is very questionable, to be fair. Um, and after black's next move, bishop b4, uh, black should already have a big advantage here. Um, it doesn't look that way immediately, but we will see after the complications, rookie 2, getting the uh, rook out of danger. And there is this very nice improvement over the game, which goes rook h to g8, saying that now if you take on f5, I will simply open up the, the g file, and after queen, king h1, this brilliant move, queen takes e5. Now, okay, d4 is hanging, you know the pawn, and if you take here, you will simply get checkmated on the back rank. So that's a nice uh, line. But instead, if they play the move bishop f4, the complications after f6 really favor um, really favor black. So uh, t for first off, we're attacking this knight, um, and we have some typical uh, threats here. For example, I think if the knight retreats to d3, um, I'm not sure if this move is good or not, but this looks like a very typical tactic, knight c3, where the queen is hanging, and if you take here, knight takes e2, king f1, rook takes d5, yeah, in this kind of position, you're just simply up in exchange. Uh, we will see this, actually, this tactic later on in this game. Um, and so, if g takes f5 here, then now fe5. And it's very funny, because the knight is hanging, but if you take here, then we will simply play gf5 with a discovered check and winning the queen. So, f6 is better. Trying to close down the position, but now we take on f4. After rook takes e4, queen g5 check, we will pick up the f6 pawn, and here after queen g5, black is simply up in development um, and has moves like rook g to f8 next uh, to try to exchange off the rooks and activate the rook as well. And you know, there are so many weaknesses in white's position, um, even the back rank is weak and white is struggling here, to say the least. So that's one move. But it's a bishop takes g4 was played, which is also a good move. And it's after knight takes g4, white plays his, uh, black plays this beautiful move, knight c3. After queen d5, knight takes e2, uh, we will actually win an exchange here. But at the very end of the day, we have a rook for two, uh, for two minor pieces. And at first glance, it doesn't seem like, you know, maybe after the, ne the next move, we can see that black is clearly much better after rook d4, knight e3, and then rook h4. And simply... Uh, yeah, the, the h2 pawn is going to drop next after knight f1 and the bishop d6. And I don't think there's more to be said about this position since uh, after we take the h2 pawn, the h pawn will simply run forward and win, win the game. And so that's all I want to show from this game. Uh, the next game oops, um, is, uh, is the game Rajabov versus Kramnik. And here, e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, d6, knight f3, knight e4 d4, d5, bishop d3, knight c6. Again, the move order doesn't really matter behind, you know, bishop e7 or knight c6 first. Uh, but castles, bishop e7, and c4, another line uh, with c4. Knight b4, and now cd5. We will look at this line again. Knight d3, queen d3, queen takes d5, rook e1, bishop f5, and now this move g4. So now this forces the bishop to come back to g6 because we simply cannot take on g4 since rook takes e4 wins a piece. So bishop g6, and now knight c3. So white's idea is that after we have to take on c3 first off, and queen takes c3, the idea is that the king is actually stuck in the center because of this bishop on the on e7. And so it becomes a bit awkward, but as long as black knows the next move and the next couple of moves, they're going to be fine. First off, black plays move f6. Um, okay, so material is equal. Um, if you take on, on c7 here, then I believe after castles, the knight on f3 is actually hanging. And if you take on e7 here, you can black and also consider moves like rook a to e8. Um, yeah, getting a tempo. Um, so yeah, that's not really desirable. And so bishop f4 was played in this game. And now king f7, a very important move. Now if white now takes on c7, putting pressure on this on the bishop, white will, black will simply play rook h8, defending the bishop. Uh, knight h4 has been played once before. And now we don't want to give up the bishop pair so easily. So we play the move bishop e4, closing up the e file. And so, um, yeah, there's also the possibility of the move g5. And so uh, white probably needs to play this move knight f5, uh, allowing us to take on f5. And okay, taking on f5 is kind of risky because of bishop d6. 
So rook a d8 here is very nice to put some pressure on d4 and still some pressure on f5. And so bishop g3 makes sense, uh, safeguarding the king. Uh, rook g7, kicking the queen away, queen c2. And after rook e to d8, um, simply this position is just equal. Um, it's, you know, the pawn on f5 and the pawn on d4 are weak. Um, black can also simply play with the move bishop f8 and retreat with the king to g8 with a very fine and solid position. Um, this should have, um, this should be no problem uh, for black. So instead of queen takes c7, h4 is the critical try to try to push h5. And so black will need to play h5 themselves. And after queen takes c7, rook h to e8, defending the bishop. And now black, white has only one move that can maintain equality, but it's a very forcing move, which is not g5 check, since the knight on f3 is hanging and also the pawn on g4. So they have to go for this, uh, for this very adventurous knight jump. So after fg5 and bishop takes g5, we will simply lose the bishop next, but it doesn't matter because the black, the white king is also exposed as a result of this g4 and h4. So now king g8, getting out of rook takes e7 with check. Bishop takes e7, queen takes d4, uh, attacking g4, so gh5, bishop takes h5, queen e5, trying to trap the queens, uh, but now queen g4. And after queen g3, uh, rook ac8, uh, white, uh, black is nicely using um, the fact that uh, you know, we don't want to take on g3 because it will uh, connect the pawns, but we are playing with activity here with the possibility of rook c2. And in the game, bishop, queen takes g4 was played, bishop takes g4, bishop b4, and after the move, the very nice move, bishop e2, this actually just cuts down the e file and prepares moves with, uh, uh, such as rook c4 to attack the h5, you know, the h4 pawn and the bishop, and also rook c2 to put some pressure here. And so after rook ac1, the game was just drawn because um, in this position, because if we trade off the rooks, then after rook e4, uh, we will win back uh, the pawn and be perfectly safe here with a symmetrical pawn structure, more or less. Um, so yeah, that's the um, the second tactical game. And the last tactical game is actually this uh, game, uh, Pavasevich versus Bartosz Soko. Um, and so just refresh here. Okay. so. After e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, d6, knight f3, knight takes e4, d4, d5, bishop d3, knight c6, again we get this position, and pawn is e4, knight b4, and now we will look at the move cd5. So here after knight takes d3, again queen d3, queen takes d5, there's actually another forcing line after, oops, after rook e1, bishop f5, and the move knight c3, takes, takes. And now black has a very nice move here, which is the reason why perhaps g4 was played in the previous game, is to avoid this move bishop e6, which now covers up the e-file and prepares to just simply castle. And if white is unable to keep the king in the center, then for example, a move like queen takes e7, bishop d6, queen c2, and castles, black has a very good position here with uh, compensation for the pawn, because first off, the pawn on d4 is an isolated pawn, Black has the bishop here. Can play the move f6 next to next to dominate the knight on uh, the knight on f3, and Black is looking very very healthy here. So, for example, knight g5, bishop f5 would just be very nice for Black. Um, so instead of that, um, another line which is possible is move bishop g5, um, saying that now if you take on g5, there's a move rook e5, and this gets quite annoying with knight takes g5 next. So bishop d6 here, uh, defending the c7 pawn and preparing the castle. And now bishop h4 is played. Um, and after castles, a3, rook f8. Black is already slightly better here because black has the bishop here. And um, eventually this idea of playing f6 becomes very real to kind of dominate this knight on f3. And if white plays the move bishop g3, then we can simply take and fight against this isolated pawn. So that's nice. Um, yeah, instead, rook e5 is played in this game. And after queen to queen to d7, um, the only way for uh, white to keep the black king in the center is this move d5. So uh, again, if they play a move like bishop g5, then after the move f6, white can play rook e3 here, getting the rook out of danger and preparing rook e1, rook a to e1. But after we take here, rook a e1, we'll simply castle and get no problems from such a position. Um, okay, first off, Possibly castling long is better to put pressure on the d pawn. 
uh, and the king is quite safe on c8. So after rook, rook to e6 and bishop f6, we have a lot of pressure here. And for example, rook 6 to e4, defending the pawn, queen d5. And black has a very active position, you know, if rook c1 to try to threaten mate is played, c6. And black has, white has, white has some problems here with the rook on e4. So black is doing very fine in this kind of complications with bishop g5. And so d5 is the critical move. And okay, we need to take the pawn, bishop d5. And now rook takes e7. A very nice sacrifice here. So there are a couple other moves here. Um, it's a very interesting game and position here. Because white can play the move bishop g5 here, preparing rook uh, a to e1. And after f6, rook a to e1. As, uh, sorry, rook a to e1. <laughs> uh, sacrificing the full rook. But after fe5 and knight e5, there will actually be a lot of pressure on this uh, bishop uh, because of the rook also. And so here, queen e6. Pinning the, uh, pinning the knight, but now bishop take e7, queen e7, and knight g6 will actually win the queen. But after the sequence, it turns out that black is a material. But luckily for white, they are able to force a perpetual check with queen e5, queen e5, bishop e6, queen g7, leading to a draw. Otherwise, they're just going to be down a piece for no good reason. So bishop g5 is possible, and this move bishop h6 is a very surprising move that. If you're unaware of it, you might just get very scared. But here, okay, we castled in bishop xg7 is a serious problem um, because of this queen putting pressure on the diagonal. So here, long castles is best, getting the king out of danger. But also now, if they take on g7, at some point, black will be able to take advantage of the g file. And now, first off, it's important to play rook hg8. Um, so here, um, yeah, it just puts pressure on the e-file, prepares to challenge the rook potentially. And in the game that has been played in the past, rook a to e1 has been played. But after f6, kicking the uh, rook away, rook 5 to e3, and bishop takes f3. Uh, surprisingly, yeah, black has, a, okay, black is in, uh, black is actually a better position here after, if they play gf3, which is a better move, then rook g8, attacking the bishop and pinning it. Rook e7, takes on g7, takes, takes. And king f okay king f1 and after queen h6, the white king is simply unsafe here. And due to the double pawns, we pawn in h2, black is simply better. Um, so instead, uh, if rook takes f3, then this is even worse, because after the move bishop b4, white is white is lost. And at first glance, you're like, what is this move? But all, it all has to do with the back rank. After queen takes b4, because of the skewer, this is forced. White ha black has a beautiful move, queen a4. And now this controls the d1 square, attacks the queen, and simply this one loses to rook takes e1. And so a white is forced to play the move queen c3, but after takes on e1, queen e1, and rook d1, white is, white is simply lost. Because they're going to just have a rook and a bishop for, for the queen, which is not enough. Uh, so that's a very nice line as well. Uh, and so instead, the move h3 is actually an improvement over rook a to e1. But after bishop c6, gaining control over the um, over the d file, our rook e3 makes sense. Uh, bishop d6, improving the bishop, um, and the move knight e5 here kind of attacks the bishop. So we're kind of forced to give back the um, the bishop pair, and so this is kind of the the line that kind of equalizes for uh, for white. But you know, after rook g8. Black has some pressure here with unpleasant pressure on g on g2. So white probably needs to try to neutralize it. But queen d5, um, and for example f3 and rook g to e8. And black is already fighting for advantage here because of the misplaced uh, pieces. The bishop on e5 is going to be kicked away, and black is doing very well here. So it's a very. It looks like white was active for the first you know 15 moves of the game, but suddenly black took over there. So instead, rook takes e7 is actually the critical line. And after queen takes e7, bishop g5, white wants to play the move rook e1 really quickly. And after f6, rook e1, black is forced to play the move bishop e6 um, and kind of block the you know, block the e file. Um, and so if they play a move like bishop f4, which is very passive, simply after c5, it controls the d4 square, preventing knight e4, and black is simply up, a, up, a, up an exchange and a pawn. So this is winning. So instead, they have to play the move knight d4, attacking this guy, and we need to uh, get our king out of danger, so castles long is the way to go. After knight e6, fg5, we will actually just liquidate this position. Okay, so our queen is hanging, so queen d8, queen g7, h5, 
And this position is just equal material. Uh, rookie six was played, uh, rookie eight. After the exchange share, um, okay, queen takes g5 was played, but we can win the f2 pawn, and this position is just equal. Eventually, the game ended up in a draw with queen d5, and you know, nothing to play for really here. So, a draw was agreed here. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just a threefold repetition. So, yeah, another very tactical game that just leads to equality here. Uh, so yeah, the next game is going to be very uh, strategic in nature. Um, the next couple of games. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, d6, knight f3. So we'll just get the same exact position as before. Castle, bishop e7, c4, knight b4. And now the move bishop e2, which is more strategic. And now we will simply get our king out of danger with castles. And here, if white plays a move like knight c3, then we have this very typical move. So we don't want to take on c3 and get our knight kick back, right? So we play the move bishop f5, very typical in this variation. And so after a3, now we don't want to retreat the knight since our pawn on d5 hangs. So now we're forced to take on c3, we retreat with the knight to c6, rook e1, rook e8, mirroring what white is doing. Um, and if cd5, queen d5, and bishop f4, this looks like a very fine position after rook ac8. With ideas of possibly knight e5, you know, b6, bishop d6 at some point. Um, but it's very important that if you want to go for this knight e5 move to control the some of the light squares on the queen side, that we don't walk into knight e5. So we want to keep this knight on e5 until we're able to play move like bishop d6 uh, to further control the e5 square um, and trade off some pieces. Uh, so that's very important. Instead of bishop f4 immediately, then after d takes e4, bishop takes e4 and bishop d6, we can take here and this becomes a very equal position. Um, yeah, knight g5, bishop g6 looks completely fine for um, for black. So, yeah, that's a possible line. But instead of a3 here, kicking the knight back immediately, knight c6, cd5, queen d5, and knight c3. So white is arguing that uh, they will get this kind of hanging pawn structure after this sequence, but they have the possibility of maybe pushing the pawn to c4 at some time later. And now bishop f5. The bishop is best on this diagonal, and it's very nice since this bishop is actually on e2 and not on d3 that we're able to play this move. And now bishop e3. Um, yeah, probably not best. Bishop f4 or rook e1 are probably better, but bishop e3 is played. And now knight e5, taking control of some of the light squares. Rook e1, now b6, getting the pawn out of danger. And now white seeing their mistake, they play bishop f4. And I really like this uh, sequence that, white, that black played, which is the move rook a to d8. So it might look very natural to play them with bishop d6, but this is exactly not what we should do because uh, this rook on a8 is actually very loose on this diagonal, and so white has the very nice move knight h4, preparing bishop f3. And since the bishop is not on e7, this move knight h4 is possible. Um, and so after rook a to e8, knight f5, bishop f4, okay, since we don't want to give up the bishop pair, we're going to end up with this sequence, but after bishop d3, White has simply a great knight on f5 here, just anchored into the position. So I don't love the position for uh, for black. Instead, rook a d8 is better. And the point is that bishop takes c7 walks into rook d to c8, putting pressure on the c-file and the c4 pawn. Um, so pawn to c4. Um, yeah, since the white doesn't want to allow rook takes c3 there. So queen b7, attacking the bishop. Bishop g3, knight takes c4. Knight h4 is played. And now after bishop takes h4, giving up this bishop is important so that um, yeah, so that the f5 square is not a potential outpost for the for the um, white knight. And so after bishop takes h4, bishop e6 is nice to try to blockade the d5 square. After bishop f3, bishop d5, rook e7 was played, but now bishop takes f3 just kind of liquidates here. Here takes takes, and then here f6 is very nice. I cut out this bishop. And even giving up the a7 pawn is no problem because of rook a8, winning later the a3 pawn. Takes here, knight takes a3, f3, challenging the rook. And this position is no problem at all. For example, d5, rook f7, preparing rook d7 also. And this pawn on, um, yeah, on d6 is also going to be won very soon. And we're just going to have a liquidation of the position. And a draw was agreed here. Okay, the next game we will look at is a game Peter Leko versus Boris Gelfand. And after we reach the main position, b4, bishop e2, castles, knight c3, bishop f5, a3, takes takes, knight c6, rook e1. So this is possibly a better move. Um, 
So yeah, again, if CD5, the Queen D5 results in the same position as before. Um, yeah, just uh, transposing there. So Rook E1 is better just to put pressure on the E file. It's a universal move. Uh, B Rook E8, CD5, Queen D5, Bishop F4. And so this is kind of an improvement over the previous game. But here after rook ac8 uh, defending the c pawn, this might look a bit awkward because the rook is not great on c8, but it it fulfills a duty and it will later uh, get more active. So bishop d3 here. So it's important actually uh, possibly to not allow this trade because ideas of knight g5 come alive and this queen is actually quite nice on d3, preparing c4 at some point then d5. So yeah, queen d7 is a better move. After rook b1, attacking b7, so now b6, and d5, this is critical. And now white should trade off the, uh, black should trade off the bishops. This is kind of forced um, if you don't want to allow knight e5. So queen takes d3, and now bishop takes a3 is critical since um, you cannot take this knight and since the queen is hanging. And also before in this line after bishop d3, if you play dc6, uh, then after queen f5, there's an attack on the bishop and also the rook on c1, uh, on b1. So this is not good. Um, and so instead queen d3, Bishop takes a3, knight g5. And so this is what, what white is arguing, that the queen is actually nice, nicely played on, uh, placed on d3 to put pressure on h7. And this forces g6, but now this weakens the dark squares. And now knight e4, queen f5. Um, so attacking the bishop, and also uh, controlling the f6 square. So now white can go for a very forcing sequence here, starting out with bishop c7, rook c7, knight f6. So this wins the rook uh, on e8. But after we enter the sequence, rook e8, king g7, dc6, and bishop c5, um, yeah, white will white will have okay an exchange for um, a bishop and a pawn, but it won't be enough. After rook b2, uh, rook takes e6, queen d8, queen takes d8, we trade off these pieces and play a5. Simply, there's no breakthrough for white here, so I don't really see the point of continuing this game further. Uh, potentially a4 a3 is also an idea you know if the rook leaves the d file then rook d rook d6 and i can see black you know getting a lot of activity for their pieces here so yeah this game is quite a nice illustration of the exchange sacrifice with such a solid position um resulting from it uh the next game is dan perry versus Simeon vinchev um i'm not sure if this game is um correspondence i believe it is but uh, yeah, anyways, we will see this line, knight c5, d6, here, knight c4, d4, d5, bishop d3, knight c6, castles, bishop e7, and this side line, this move, knight bd2. Now, I call this Ivanchuk line because Ivanchuk played this against Kramnik in the 2007 World Blitz Championship. But I can't, I couldn't find the game, actually, because I think there was something wrong with the, uh, with, um, the notes itself since there were a bunch of blunders and uh, gross mistakes that were not i mean it, it, it couldn't have been right um uh, in that game according to the database so anyways i just called this the Ivanchuk klein and it's interesting because hans Niemann also played this recently in the 2023 tournament of peace against Ivanchuk, and so it shows that he's very up to date with his theory and this move seems to pose a bit of problems for 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 black but they should be fine at the end of it if they play this correctly. So now after knight takes d2, okay, another line is knight d6 followed by bishop f5, but knight takes d2 is the most principled move. Bishop takes d2, and now bishop g4. Again, important before white plays the move h3. And now c3. Castles, and white plays h3. So white is very, um, very solid here, and just playing some useful moves c3 and h3, and actually has a very specific purpose. Uh, to, uh, behind this h3 move is after bishop h5 white plays this very nice maneuver very thematic maneuver when the bishop is on g4 is to play this move g3 with the idea of, of unpinning with king g2 and later king C and queen c2 and later uh we will see uh for example if the bishop retreats to g6 takes takes pawn to h4 white gets some initiative there but um black has a very um simple way to try to uh get equality here after queen d7, very logical to attack h3. Uh, queen also belongs on d7 here, free connecting the rooks. King g2, bishop g6. And now the point is that if white plays bishop takes g6, it's important not to take with the h pawn, which would allow pawn to h4. And later h5, you know, knight g5, stuff like this gets really annoying. So instead, f takes g6. 
And it's rare that FTX G6 is good in this position, but uh, in this type of position, but it's actually very good here. Since now after, for example, Queen C2, Rook A8, Rook A1, Bishop D6, Black gets control over the E5 square and is not allowing the, pawn, the knight to jump to E5. Queen B3 makes sense, attacking B7 and D5. So now Knight E7, defending this pawn. Um, C4 makes sense because if you take on B7, the Rook B8 picks up the B2 pawn with activity down the file. So C4 here makes sense, DC4, Queen C4, King H8, and if Knight G5, then simply H6, and there are no threats with you know Knight F7 since the King can simply step up, step up to H6. So Rook E2 makes sense, but now B5 kicking the Queen away, Queen B3, H6, now preventing any Knight G5 jumps, preparing King H7, and also after Rook F1, Black has this beautiful square in F5 just for the Knight, and it's perfectly positioned here. And after we trade off some rooks, this position will be simply equal. Let's say queen d5 here, pitting the bishop, preparing some knight e5 jumps. So, you know, we need to defend the g6 pawn, king e7, king e knight e5, queen c8, retreating to the back rank. But after the move knight c6, which is played twice, this very nice move queen e8 actually defends the a7 pawn. And if you exchange off all the pieces here, um, yeah, black will be simply closer to equality and uh, the queen will actually activate on the on the e-file. So this is no problem at all. Um, but it's just very important to know this f takes g6 idea. Now instead of bishop takes g6, a better move here is actually bishop f4. But um, yeah, it's very interesting because, okay, the bishop belongs on f4 here. And if uh, we play the natural move, natural looking queen takes bishop takes e 3 which was played by Ivanchuk against, um, yeah, against uh, Neiman, after queen takes d3 uh, and Bishop d6, trying to trade off the bishops. Knight g5 comes, and this becomes really annoying. Uh, after g6, uh, due to the threat on h7, bishop d6, queen d6, rook a to e1 is played, rook a to e8, and pawn to h4. What is simply pressing here? And it's, yeah, Neiman won a really nice game, actually, um, showing how to increase the pressure. And later, black made a lot of weaknesses and uh, just uh, fell apart. So instead of bishop takes d3, a better move here and very nice move is actually the move bishop e4. So this is all possible because of this pin on the knight on f3. And so later, what has to like move the king away to h2, for example? And the idea is after rook e1, pawn to f5, and the king and the bishop is nicely supported on uh, on the e4 square. And after king h2, stepping away from the pin, bishop d6, trying to trade off the bishops, and now knight e5 is critical. So we want to take the bishop, uh, take the knight with the bishop, since now bishop takes e5, runs to d5 with a with a pressure, you know, with a tempo on the bishop. So bishop takes e5, d5, and now queen e7, with the idea of both pushing pawn to g5, um, and also uh, preparing maybe rook a to e8 later. Um, and yeah, the I mean the main move is bishop g. Uh, the main idea is the point is the pawn to g5 move, um, and here the. Correspondence play has shown that bishop b5 is kind of the way to kind of put pressure on the on the position Trying to take on c6 later, but pawn to g5 Bishop c6, bc6 um, Simply, yeah, okay, because now after bishop d2 uh, Since we don't have the knight on c6 anymore, we cannot take the pawn on e5 And so pawn to g4 here is the idea Now if h takes g4 Then I believe um, f takes g4 here is quite annoying Um or also queen takes e5 looks very natural actually since now if you take on f5 here queen takes f5 pawn on f2 possibly is under threat so yeah i think queen takes e5 is a very nice response and this is a very dangerous position for the for the white king so bishop f4 is better saying that now you've given up control of the f4 square i'm just gonna park my bishop there pawn to h5 supporting the pawn um pawn to h4 because sooner or later white is probably gonna have to play h4 um yeah, to prevent from black from playing the pawn to h4. And so now, moves like a5 here, expanding on the queen side, uh, for example, b4 and a3, uh, just fixes the pawn structure, and I don't really see a way for either side to make any progress. And so, yeah, a draw was soon agreed uh, in this game. Uh, just an equal position, you know. Um, a, a nice way to try to um, put pressure on black if they're... You know, if they assume that the position is completely dead equal, you know, drawn. But there are there is some venom in this line. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm I think that I managed to show the way to equality here. Um, the next game is Anand versus Kramnik. Uh, after e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, 
Knight e5. Okay, we will just enter the main position. G7, rookie one. So here, bishop g4 is important, actually. Since we don't care of bishop takes e4, since that will um, give up the bishop pair, and black has black is going to have a leading development in such a position. So, pawn to c3. So now, if they move, if they play the moves pawn to c4, it's important to see that they don't actually have a knight on c3 or knight on d2. So there is actually a threat of cd5 and, you know, the knight on e4 being undermined. So best here is knight f6, retreating with the knight back, knight c3. And now this actually sacrifices a pawn. You can either take the pawn on d4 immediately or play the move bishop f3. After queen f3, knight takes d4. I think that this is the easiest line to getting equality. Queen d1, dc4, bishop takes c4, c5. And, you know, if we do, if, if white is too slow, we will simply castle and just be up a pawn. So queen e4 check is critical here. And after queen d7 takes takes and bishop e3, um, yeah, um, this looks like a, uh, like, it doesn't, s you know, it, it seems interesting because, um, okay, first off, bishop f7 is possible, just restoring material equality. And I'm not sure that, um, okay, like knight c2 is possible here and then rook d1 check. And the position is equal objectively, but it's kind of, it looks kind of dangerous for black, to be honest. Um, but again, this move bishop e3 is interesting as well. Um, after rook hd8, bishop d4, cd4, bishop b5 check, the black king is actually forced to go to the center of the board because the bishop on e7 is hanging. And after rook d one and king c5, we will actually get a draw by repetition here. So now if you take on e7, then after dc3, you know, black is, white is in a load of trouble here. Uh, pawn on c3 is actually very strong also. So instead, rook e5, king d6, and then just simply retreating back since the rook is hanging, and then just repeating with this. And I believe Ivanchuk versus Wang Yue uh, you know, uh, had this position and just went for this repetition. Um, so instead of pawn to c4, pawn to c3, and now black plays a move f5. And this seems very risky at first glance, um, but actually the knight on e4 is nicely um, supported, and pawn to c4 to undermine our center is a bit too slow because they've played pawn to c3 now. And so uh, after f5, queen b3, castles. So we don't really mind queen takes b7 here, uh, simply because it will waste too much time. Um, yeah, for example, uh, queen takes b7, I believe queen d6 makes sense. Uh, bishop f3 also uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I'm not sure which move is best, but it looks very, very much playable for black. Instead, knight bd2 was played, and after knight a5, queen a4, knight c6, this can very easily repeat, and this is possibly why, uh, you know, the Petrov has such a draw's reputation. There are so many draws, draws possible, knight a5 back, but instead bishop b5 is possible. And now it's, uh, it's interesting because it doesn't look like there's a good way for, uh, black to con for black to continue, because if we retreat with the knight to b8 to try to reroute it to d7, we're allowing the knight to occupy e5. And again, we don't want to take on f3 here, since it gives out the bishop for no good reason. And if we play the knight takes g2, which is played by Anand at a later, um, a later 1998, um, after knight d2, queen d6, h3, bishop h5, and knight b3, White suddenly got a big advantage after the following move, knight b3, attack and b7, and there's just too much pressure in black's position, so this is not very good. Instead, the way to um, to actually equalize is this move, bishop h4, attacking the pawn on f2, and forcing pawn to g3. And after bishop f6, we've actually just provoked the pawn to coming to g3, so now there's a potential threat of f4 at some later moment. So even if we give up a pawn with this sequence, queen c6, rook e8, now it's suddenly white that doesn't have a great way to move forward if they don't sacrifice a pawn back. Uh, for example, we have just ideas of pawn to f4 already in the position. Or, um, yeah, pawn to f4 already, just trying to open up the king. And so knight e5 here is kind of important. Bishop e5, d5, and now seeing that there is, are weaknesses on the light squares, white plays, uh, black plays the move knight g5. And also has this has the threat of f4. For example, you know, if we play a random move like I don't know, pawn to b4 or something, move like f4 looks very dangerous since gf4 walks into knight h3, picking up with the pawn and ruining the pawn structure already. So this looks like a very good position for for black. 
So instead of that, uh, F4 was played by White themselves to prevent this F4 advance. And so knight h2 check, king g2, rook b8, making it a bit more difficult to uh, for white to untangle. And after pawn to c4, trying to free the position, dc4, knight c4, queen d3, white's queen gets very active here and already is threatening possibilities of like queen c2 ideas. Uh, so knight e3 is played, trying to attack the bishop, but now this very, this very nice sequence, rook takes b2. And after bishop takes b2, queen d2 check, forces the king to come to h1, but now after knight f2, king g1, knight h3, just leads to a draw. Um, so yeah, even, you know, with best play, it does end up uh, in a draw. Uh, but that just kind of shows, uh, you know, the equalizing power of the Petrov. Uh, the next game is Wasi So versus Wang Yue. e4, e5. Okay, we will just reach the main position here. Let's see, 6, bishop e7, rook e1, bishop e4 again. And now pawn to c4. And again, okay, knight f6. So, yeah, we will actually get, um, okay, after knight c3, uh, yeah, I think this is the line that I showed before, um, yeah, after knight takes, uh, bishop takes f3 and knight takes d4, so that was the line, knight takes d4, um, but I believe that there is actually an easier solution here, uh, rather than bishop takes f3, which is the move knight takes d4 immediately, um, and after cd5, bishop f3, gf3, ruining the pawn structure, uh, okay, there is a threat potentially of this knight being weak or undermined, so pawn to c5 is kind of forced, uh, supporting the knight. And, you know, if you take on passant, then knight takes c6, uh, the pawn structure has been ruined for no good reason. So, instead, d6 is best. Try to keep the king in, stuck in the center after queen takes d6. Knight b5. Now this forces knight takes b5. Um, and after uh, bishop takes b5, king f8. And, um, okay, if you trade off the queens, then black will be up a pawn. Uh, and, you know, fighting against the weakness of the structure. Uh, so instead, queen e2, keeping the king tied to the e7 bishop. And now h6, preventing bishop g5 and getting some loot lift for the king. And now bishop f4 was played um, both times this was, this position has been reached. Um, after queen f4, queen e7, king g8, and rook ad1, it looks like white is very active. But, white ha but black has this very nice move, h5 which manages to untangle the position because they have ideas of rook h6 to g6 next. And it, without this maneuver, I think it becomes quite difficult for black to equalize. But after this move, black is doing fine. Um, rook d6 was played, and now pawn to c4. Very important move. If white plays him, if black plays the move rook queen takes f3, then after rook e3, uh, simply, you know, the queen is getting kicked back and uh, moves like rook g3 come next and a lot of pressure on the position. So this is unpleasant. Instead, um, and I believe after, actually after rook e3, queen f4, I think bishop d3 is actually the best move. Yeah, with the threat actually of rook d8 check uh, leading to mate. And also this is just a very dominant uh, position. Uh, this is big trouble. So instead, pawn to c4 is very important to, get, to stop this bishop from retreating back to d3. And so bishop a4, preparing bishop c2. But now we take an f3 and it's a bit different here. So rook e5 was played. Rook h6, preparing rook g6, and if we get this move in, we can simply untangle. We're also nicely defending the um, the uh, knight on f6 from any possible threats of rook f6. So now rook d8 check, takes takes, uh, king h7, bishop b3, g6 is kind of forced, but after rook c5, okay, if we give them one more move than rook c8 is deadly uh, because of our lack of coordination with the rook on h6. But now queen g4 is just in time to give a perpetual check. And after this sequence, this, yeah, just we should draw very soon. So again, another, another, um, very wild draw, but again, a, a draw nonetheless. Okay, next game we will look at is Anon versus Kramnik again. e45, knight f3, knight f6. Okay, we will get this position. And actually, yeah, this move, the Nemzovich attack is very interesting because a couple of years ago, it was, it became a lot more popular than the, um, than the main line that we saw before. Um, and the idea behind White's play is that they will actually play the move either bishop e3 or bishop f4, and then queen d2 in the long castle, and then try to run these pawns up the board, you know, try to attack the black king once they've castled short. And typically, casting short is, I think, the uh, antidote to uh, White's setup. But it's very important to know where to place your pieces. After bishop e7, uh, we will look at a couple of um, um, setups. First off, we will, in this game, we will look at the move bishop f4, in the next game, we will look at bishop e3. Um, and in, I'll also mention this move, bishop d3, 
which I think is slightly inaccurate because it gives us a target. Since we know that this bishop is very powerful on this diagonal, we don't want to allow it to survive. And so I recommend this move in knight d7, which has the intention of going to c5. And so, um, let me start. First off, castling, castling, and then knight d7. So, the, uh, okay, first off, casting short is probably not right. But the general idea is that black wants to play the knight to d7 so it can prepare knight c5. And even if, you know, let's see, bishop e3 and knight c5 comes, you know, if you retreat, then this is a big uh, win strategically for the black pieces. And if you go bishop c4, after bishop e6, black is managing to trade off a pair of bishops with a completely fine position. Uh, and if you take on c5, then this structure is very fine for black, uh, for black as well, since this knight on f3 is actually dominated, uh, on, you know, with the, pawn, uh, with the pawn on c5 controlling the square on d4. After rook e1, bishop d6, knight d2 trying to get some squares on, on e4, bishop e6, um, queen h5 is possible to try to threaten checkmate, and now it's important to actually be the move h6. So g6 would be very natural, but if we see that this knight is possibly coming to e4, to f6 or g5, we don't really want to make a move like g6. So h6 is a lot better. And now after knight e4, pawn to c4 just shuts down this bishop. And this is a very nice thematic idea in this Nimzovich attack, is to shut down this bishop. Bishop f1, and now bishop e7. And okay, you know, okay, it allows rook a d1, and we go queen e8, uh, preparing queen c6 here. And after a move like knight d2, trying to attack the pawn, pawn to b5, knight f3, uh, preparing knight d4, so pawn to c5. And if we look at the position, like, I'm very happy to see such a position for black, since uh, they have a nice pawn majority on this, uh, you know, pawn, sp uh, the space advantage on this side of the board. Um, they have the bishop here, and the queen is a bit, uh, you know, inactive, but... Other than that, if they're able to solve this problem, they're going to be, um, they're going to have the edge here for sure. So that kind of shows this line with bishop d3 and castling short. Instead, bishop f4 is the idea. And now castles. So queen d2. And now knight d7 again. So it's important that after bishop d3, we're able to meet up with knight c5. And after castles, even now we can play the move knight c5. Um, and so the idea is it's again preventing bishop d3. And if white plays a move like, okay, knight d4, trying to centralize the knight, they have to rook e8, very natural, f3, trying to prepare g4, h4 with a pawn storm. Black can equalize here with knight e6 and just trade off some pieces. Let's say, for example, bishop e3. Um, knight takes d4 is a very simple uh, idea. After c takes d4, um, undoubling the pawns, black plays c6 and tries to run the pawns forward with b5 and a5. For example, here, we also get a nice square on e6 for our bishop. Uh, so, you know, if you play bishop e6, then pawn to d5 is, a, is an idea. So c6, preparing bishop e6, bishop d3, bishop e6, king b1 is very natural, b5, h4, and this becomes kind of a race. Uh, bishop f8 is nice to secure the king, uh, pawn to g4. And now, before we start our operations, we have to notice that white is actually quite a bit faster than black in this uh, pawn storm. And so we need to kind of disturb their their idea here with a move like bishop d3 rook d to f1 now queen c8 again preventing pawn to f4 since now the pawn on g4 will fall and there's not a, enough compensation for for the lost pawn so and now it also prepares the move queen e6 funnily enough because if they play g5 now queen e6 simply wins the pawn uh, so for example it's attacking the bishop so bishop f4 takes on e2 and after bishop c4 Black has this very nice maneuver of bringing the queen back to c8, to a6, and just with a big advantage. Um, and a bishop f4, which is better, after queen a6 attacking the a2 pawn. So this is a nice idea behind not rushing with the pawn to a5, is that we can actually plant the queen on a4 here, and then play a5 and b4 next, where the queen is actually perfectly placed on the a-file. You know, it's the queen looks kind of stranded there, but if you play b3, then this a3 pawn will fall, and... It's, yeah, it's very difficult to deal with this as white. But yeah, obviously, this is all not forced. It just uh, gives you an idea of what could happen. Instead, bishop e3 was played in this position, potentially with ideas of bishop c5. But for right now, we don't care, since a bishop takes c5 would actually surrender the bishop pair and allow us control over the central d4 square. So rook e8. So again, as I mentioned before, this position is completely fine for, for black uh, you know, we both have double pawns, but we have the bishop pair, so that's an advantage. Instead, bishop c4 is better, but now we play bishop e6, and we trade a bunch of pieces, and this should lead to equality. Takes takes, pawn to h4, 
and queen d, queen to d7 was played here. I believe that a5, a4 is possible also, uh, but queen d7 has an idea of potentially queen e4, so white plays queen d5. But I like this idea that um, the Valk played in this game, that Kramnik played in this game, is to play queen c6. Saying that now if you take out c6, which we will get in the game later, we can eventually advance a pawn to c5 and get a lot of control over the central squares, so we don't really mind the double pawns. Uh, pawn to c4, bishop f6, improving the bishop, and after g4, g6. Now, um, okay, if any any advances or attempt to attack us just allows us to trade the queens off. And so that's a very nice idea, is that we're just neutralizing the pressure, cd5, knight c5. And yeah, this, you know, with the open e-file, possibly rook e4 next, this is quite a nice position. Uh, instead, queen takes c6 was played, bc6, uh, c3, blunting the bishop c5 getting control over the position king c2 knight g7 um potentially if g5 comes then the knight can come to f5 h5 rook e4 attacking some pawns and this kind of forces okay hg6 first fg6 pawn to g5 getting the pawn out of danger bishop e7 and we can actually see that black is getting ready to uh, create some initiative with rook f8 and knight f5 coming attacking the bishop on e3 putting pressure on the f file so white decided to play rook h4 in this position and the game was drawn because we're also attacking the c4 pawn which is important so black can mount some pressure if white is not careful and so rook h4 leads just to just equality after we trade off the rooks and rook f8 again so yeah just a fine position uh, the next and last game we will look at is the game between carlson and caruana e45 knight f3 knight f6 okay we will enter the main position uh, after knight c3, d c3, bishop e7, bishop e3, and so we will look at the next setup with bishop e3 instead of bishop f4. And the c and the thing is that if we play knight d7 to c5, uh, then it will allow bishop to c5 in one go instead of white having to play bishop f4 back to e3 and then taking on c5. And this one tempo is very important, and so it changes the nature of the position completely. And so we will have to. Um, our strategic goal is later after the bishop comes to d3 is to shut it down with another way which we'll see very soon after castles queen d2 knight d7 castles and seeing that the bishop is not on d3 there's no point on knight c5 here we now can continue with knight f6 and the point is after bishop d3 pawn to c5 and after bishop e6 the pawn can actually come to c4 to even shut down this bishop if needed so rook h to e1 bishop e6 okay attacking the e2 pawn which cannot be, this shouldn't be allowed. Okay, so if bishop g5 comes, then I like this move d5, which is the main move, just controlling the center, uh, getting a nice space um, uh, and, and very solid structure here. And queen f4 is the main move, rook e8, bishop b5, and rook f8. And this typically can lead to a draw by repetition, or yeah, otherwise the potential of queen b6 or queen a5 kind of shows the uh, position of the bishop on b5 not being that great. So this can potentially lead to a draw, and if you want to avoid it, then you have to find some other, some other way. But king b1 is the move that's been played, and queen a5. So now white is essentially forced to play the move pawn to c4 if they don't want to get under serious pressure. So if they play the move uh, c4, okay, first off, after c4, we will turn off the queens and enter a fine endgame. And instead, if they play the move a3, then there are a couple ways to... Um, to fight for um, some initiative. First off, c4. This was played by Duda against Karwana, turn 19. And after bishop to e2, okay, we see that this nicely um, provokes the bishop to come to e2, so now it's less active. And now we get the e4 square for the knight. And now the only good move is queen c1. So if they play a move like queen d4, which looks very natural, attacking this guy and attacking this guy, pawn to d5. And we're actually just crashing through here with b5. Potential of bishop takes a3, potential of bishop c5 as well, uh, and just trapping the queen at some point. Uh, so for example, knight e5. And now uh, there is a threat actually of knight takes e4. So we are not in time to trap the queen because of knight takes e4. So that's unfortunate. So it said rook fc8 here is better. And uh, okay, uh, knight takes e4 potentially runs into knight c3 first, damaging the pawn structure. So uh, bishop g4 was, uh, is a line that I've investigated, and here queen b5, threatening both bishop takes a3 and also potentially bishop c5, just to trap the queen. And if, okay, for example, if rook c1, then bishop takes a3 is just simply winning. And if bishop c1, 
They're now bishop c5, and white is and white is in serious trouble. The black, the white queen is just simply trapped, and black is winning. So the very nice line showing that queen d4 is actually not playable. Instead, queen c1, and now pawn to d5, opening up the bishop. Um, bishop d4, and now there are a couple of ways to continue. There is the move queen b5, preparing a5, followed by queen coming back to a6, and then b5, b4. That's one idea. Another idea is this move b5, so that now after okay, knight d2, challenging the knight, we don't want to exchange off pieces and let white off the hook, knight f6, knight f1, preparing knight e3 to put pressure on the d5 pawn, queen c7, freeing the a pawn to move forward, f4, a5, g4, for example, and now b4. And okay, the line can continue on. You can check the BGN in the uh, link down below uh, just to see how this line can continue. But a crazy piece sacrifice can ensue. And um, yeah, okay, this piece should not be taken. B3 and a bishop d7. Yeah, so I like black's position here because black has the initiative here. Black's pieces are actually better and white king is more exposed here. Even though this position, this position should lead to equality, like I do like black's chances here, especially in a practical game. Um, for example, right now, white's pieces aren't great. The bishop on f3, uh, the bishop on e2, uh, and the knight on f1 uh, aren't amazing. Um, black is soon to uh, take control of the b-file. And yeah, you can check the PGN down below to see how this uh, variation can, can continue. Uh, but I do like black's chances in such a game. So instead of this, these complications after pawn to a3, Pawn to c4 prevents uh, black from playing pawn to c4 themselves, keeps the bishop on d3, and but, yeah, the big but is that it allows the queen exchange. So after bishop d2, important is to stop knight g5, so h6. Knight h4, now trying to get some new squares for the uh, for the knight. Potentially knight g6 also is an idea, uh, since this bishop on e6 is under pressure. So rook f8, knight g6. So white is trying to win some sort of... Um, you know, um, something to play for. So in this position, they're trying to play for the bishop pair advantage. But it, but black has a very strong move, knight g4, which I, which I think just equalizes uh, immediately. After knight e7, so the point is that it attacks f2, and even if you kick it away with f3, then after knight f2, we're able to win back the bishop pair. Um, so knight e7, rook e7, rook e2, defending f2. And now knight e5. Another point of knight g4 is to potentially attack this, um, this bishop and also the pawn on c4. So bishop f4, knight d3, rook d3, rook d7. Okay, and so we're going to lose this pawn and this pawn potentially. But after rook takes d6, rook d6, a bishop d6, and rook d8, they can't take the pawn on c5 immediately because of the back rank mate. So rook d2 is forced, and now bishop c4. And after king to c1, defending the rook, Pawn to b6. And I just want to show this endgame after bishop f4. Um, in the game, rook takes d2 was played, and it got a bit messy because after king d2, um, these pawns on the queen side are on dark squares and are on the same color as this bishop. And so eventually, um, white, is white is able to win one of the pawns, but they will reach a, um, a three on two on the queen side here, which is uh, a draw theoretically. So yeah. Uh, that's but that's possible, but instead an improvement is actually rook e8, just keeping control over the back rank, preventing bishop e8, and this position is simply equal. There's nothing to play for. B3, bishop f1, g3, um, g5, kicking the bishop away, bishop e3, rook e6, and now even if the rook gets active active to d7, after pawn to a5, there are no breaks in the position that can give white an advantage. Like for example, h4 takes takes, trying to create an imbalance, but king g7. King d2, bishop h3. Uh, okay, first off, threat, threatening a uh, discovered, uh, discovered attack. And also preparing bishop f5 to centralize the bishop. Um, and so rook d5 makes sense. But now bishop d2 is attacking the bishop. And I can very well see this repetition happening. Otherwise, there is really no way to go forward. Um, yeah, this position should be equal. Um, and so yeah, this kind of concludes um, this... Um, yeah, the coverage of the Petrov defense... Uh, specifically this bishop e7 line, the more old-fashioned move, I would say. Um, and if you want a more fighting approach, I do recommend looking at the move bishop d6 instead uh, and looking at a lot of Caruana's games. And also Nepomniachtchi also, has also picked it up recently uh, for his World Championship match and also candidates. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a very long video. Um, 
if you have any questions or additions uh, that I missed, like a specific line that I missed, then please comment those down below. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.